if you could be the world's richest person in this broken down, morally corrupt system of things, but when you die, you stop existing, or you were guaranteed to live forever in God's paradise, no more pain, suffering, or death, in a government ruled by Jesus Christ as the king of all the earth, but you were poor in this system of things, which would you choose? We'll revisit that question a little bit later, but first, let's figure out what God's kingdom is. We all know what riches and money is in this system of things, but what is God's kingdom? God's kingdom is a heavenly government that will replace all other governments and will cause God's will to be done in heaven and on earth. Many people pray for it, yet don't fully understand what it is they're actually praying for. At Matthew 6, 9, and 10, Jesus taught us what things are appropriate to pray, pray, pray for. Verse 9 reads, you must pray them this way. Our Father in the heavens, let your name be sanctified. Let your kingdom come. Let your will take place as in heaven, also on earth. Centuries earlier, the prophet Daniel accurately foretold the time when Jehovah God would replace all existing forms of government by mankind and establish his own kingdom in its place. The heavenly government that will replace all other governments will cause God's will to be done in heaven and on earth. At Daniel 2.44, we read, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not be passed on to any other people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, and it alone will stand forever. The prophecy at Daniel 2.44 states that God's kingdom will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms. Well, that prophecy refers to only to the kingdoms that were pictured by the various parts of that image in the dream, which includes the current world-dominant power of the Anglo-American governments. But what about all the other human governments in existence today, besides the one prophesied of that Anglo-American world power and the end when God's kingdom in Christ Jesus is installed. The parallel prophecy of Revelation 16, 14 reads the larger picture. It shows the kings of the entire inhabited earth will be gathered against Jehovah on the great day of God the Almighty. Hence, not only the kingdoms of the image, but also all other human governments will be destroyed at Armageddon. Yes, this kingdom, the one Jesus instructed us to pray for in the model prayer where we read, let your kingdom come, let your will take place as in heaven, also on earth. His Jehovah's namesake people have come to know the Bible prophecy and the corresponding world conditions indicate that the kingdom was established in heaven in 1914. Now, that's a different subject, and for a complete and deeper understanding, please ask any one of Jehovah's Witnesses. They'll be more than happy to explain the scriptural evidence with you. Indeed, Revelation 11.15 was fulfilled in 1914, and there we read at Revelation 11.15, the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will rule as king forever and ever. The heavenly kingdom has already proved to be far superior to human governments in the way that it cares for its subjects on earth, spiritually and physically. At this point, just, just consider some of these few examples of how Jehovah's Witnesses take care of one another in times of need. Our first large-scale relief effort in modern times was in September of 1945, just a few months after World War II ended in Europe. Brother Knorr announced the start of a large-scale campaign to send material aid to the needy brethren of Central Europe. Within weeks after that announcement, witnesses in Canada, the United States, and other lands began sorting 
and packing clothing and collecting food. From January 1946 onward, goods were sent to fellow believers in Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, China, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, England, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Hungary, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, the Philippines, Poland, and Romania. The aid program was not a one-time effort. Relief shipments continued for two and a half years. And during that time, only 85,000 brothers and sisters sent more than 700,000 pounds. It's about 300,000 kilograms of food and over 1 million pounds or about 450 kilograms of clothing. More than 124,000 pair, pairs of shoes to their brothers and sisters in war ravaged lands. By August 1948, this huge relief effort was concluded. This has certainly been an expression of love one toward another, noted the Watchtower in 1949. We know all the brethren did this as an honor to the Lord, having in mind that this material assistance would help some to carry on their true worship. And so, they esteemed it a great privilege to be able to serve their brethren in this manner. This relief effort brought praise to Jehovah, provided relief to fellow believers, and strengthened the bond of unity among the brothers worldwide. Now, about 50 years later, in 1994, some 800,000 or more people in Rwanda were killed in tribal genocide. In the aftermath of that massacre, unrest spread to other lands in Central Africa, resulting in overcrowded refugee camps. To help their afflicted fellow believers, Jehovah's Witnesses in Belgium, France, and Switzerland airlifted some 300 tons of clothing, medicine, tents, food, and other supplies. Within weeks, those supplies reached our needy brothers. Also in Africa, about that time, a team of 10 witness doctors and nurses from France had been providing relief to our brothers to alleviate their suffering caused by that civil war, famine, and disease. But in the following two years alone, the team handled over 10,000 medical consultations. Their work brought praise to Jehovah and to his organization. When we arrive in an area to help our brothers and sisters, relates one of the nurses, people say with respect, these are Jehovah's Witnesses. They've come to help their brothers. After receiving help from a nurse, one witness exclaimed, thank you, my sister. Some here may remember when Jehovah's Witnesses launched a massive construction effort following Super Typhoon Haiyan to repair or rebuild almost 750 homes in less than one year. During that extended relief effort that lasted over a year, a team of five construction volunteers would rebuild a home in five days. So, do Jehovah's Witnesses assist with disaster relief? Obviously, yes. Jehovah's Witnesses often help when disaster strikes. We provide practical relief assistance to both witnesses and non-witnesses in harmony with the Bible's instruction at Galatians 6.10, where it reads, let us work what is good toward all, but especially toward those to us uh, related to us in the faith. We also try to give emotional and spiritual support that victims sorely need at such times according to 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. And you can read countless other stories of disaster relief of every sort from our theocratic organizational efforts through the website, jw.org. Just initiate a search in the search bar under disaster relief. So Christ Jesus has been appointed as king and judge. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 reads, 
dahil isang bata ang ipini, ipinang anak sa atin. Isang anak na lalaki ang ipinagay sa atin. At ang pamahala ay iatang sa balikat niya. Siya ay tatawagin kamangahamanghang tagapayo makapangyarihan Diyos. Walang hanggang ama, prinsipya ng kapapayaan. Ang paglawak ng pamamahala niya at ang kapapayaan ay hindi magwawakas sa trono ni David at sa kaniyang kaharian para itatag ito ng matabay at panatilihin sa pamamagitan ng katarungan at katawiran nayan at magpa kailanman magyayari ito dahil sa sigasig ni Ehova ng mga pakpo. Furthermore, John 5.22 clarifies what this means even more for us as we read, For the Father judges no one at all, but he has entrusted all the judging to the Son. You see, unlike imperfect human rulers and judges, Jesus cannot be corrupted. Please note at Isaiah 11.3 what it says, speaking of that time when Jesus rules as king, and he will find delight in the fear of Jehovah. He will not judge by what appears to his eyes, nor reprove simply according to what his ears hear. For centuries, mankind has set up organizational governing bodies, and just as Jehovah has myriads of angels who act as messengers and agents that do Jehovah God's will, so too will Jesus have co-rulers with him in his government. It's been revealed at Revelation 14.1 that Jesus will have 144,000 co-rulers. Please join me there as we read Revelation 14.1. At Nakita ko ang cordero na nakatayo sa bundok siyang at may kasama siyang 144,000 na may panggalan niya at panggalan ng kaniyang ama na nakasulat sa noo nila. In the kingdom, they serve as kings and priests after the resurrection to a heavenly life. At Revelation 26, we read, Happy and holy is anyone having part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no authority, but they will be priests of God and of the Christ, and they will rule as kings with them for the thousand years. What a wonderful privilege anointed Christians have, and rightfully so, as they cherish their place in the kingdom arrangement. As Paul noted this special privilege at Philippians 3.14, where he wrote, I am pressing on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God by means of Christ Jesus. Today, the vast majority of Jehovah's Witnesses do not look forward to a life in the heavens, but happier those who will enjoy everlasting life as earthly subjects of God's paradise kingdom. These include those who will be spared when all those who oppose God's kingdom are destroyed. Notice what we're told at Revelation 7, verses 9, 13, and 14, where it reads, After this I saw and look a great crowd, which no man was able to number, out of all the nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in white robes, and there were palm branches in their hands. In response, one of the elders said to me, These who are dressed in the white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? So right away I said to him, My Lord, you are the one who knows. And he said to me, These 
are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Jesus' illustration of the sheep and the goats helps us to understand what is required for survival. At Matthew 25, 31 through 33, we read, Sa pagdating ng anak ng tao na may malakin autoridad kasama ang lahat ng engel uupo sa sa kaniyang malu walhating trono. Ang lahat ng pansa ay titipunin sa harap niya at pag pagbubukod buku kuring niya ang mga tao kung paanong ibinubukod ng pastol ang mga tupa mula sa mga gambi at italagay niya ang mga tupa sa kaniyang kanan. Pero ang mga kambin ay sa kaniyang kaliwa. Well, today, we have a clear understanding of the illustration of the sheep and the goats. Regarding the identity of those mentioned, Jesus is the Son of Man, the King. Those referred to as my brothers are spirit-anointed men and women who will rule with the Christ from heaven, the sheep and the goats represent individuals from all the nations. Sheep-like ones loyally support Christ's brothers, the anointed. In Matthew 25, 34 through 40, we read, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who have been blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the founding of the world. For I became hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you received me hospitably. Naked, and you clothed me. I fell sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous ones will answer him with the words, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and receive you hospitably or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? In reply, the king will say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Supporting the anointed in the global preaching work requires active participation as noted at Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of people of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. And look, I am with you all the days until the conclusion of the system of things. At Philippians 1.27, the Apostle Paul encouraged the congregation at Philippi to behave in a manner worthy of the good news. Now that Greek expression that Paul used for the word behave may also be rendered carry on as citizens. Paul's admonition to carry on as citizens applies principally to those who will rule with Christ in heaven. But, but, by extension, it can be applied to all those who will be earthly subjects of God's kingdom. Well, why can we say that? Because all dedicated Christians serve the same king, Jehovah, and must live up to the same standards. Today, people work hard to qualify to become citizens of a prosperous country. They must learn the history, speak the language, learn the laws of the country that they are allowed citizenship status in. So let's briefly examine three things that we must do if we're to retain the honor of being kingdom citizens. First, let's learn the language. Some human governments require that those applying for citizenship 
speak the dominant language of the country. Even after being granted citizenship, people may strive for years to master that new language. Similarly, God's kingdom requires that its citizens learn what the Bible calls the pure language. At Zephaniah 3, verse 9, it says, For then I will change the language of the peoples to a pure language, so that all of them may call on the name of Jehovah to serve him shoulder to shoulder. What is that language? It's the truth about God and about his purposes as found in the Bible. Not only do we speak the pure language, but our conduct is in accord with God's laws and principles. Second, we must study the history. A person desiring to become a citizen of a human government might have to learn something about the government's history. Likewise, those desiring to be kingdom citizens do well to learn all they can about God's kingdom. The more you learn about God's organization and how Jehovah supports his people, the more real God's kingdom will be to you. As a result, your desire to preach the good news of the kingdom will naturally intensify. Third, we've got to learn the laws, know the laws. Human governments require that their subjects learn and obey the laws of the land. So it only seems reasonable then that Jehovah expects, expects us to learn and obey the laws and the principles that govern all kingdom citizens. Human laws are often flawed and may be unfair. In contrast, the law of Jehovah is perfect. Nobody else can say this. Nobody else can do this for us. One wonderful way to accomplish all of these steps to citizenship is to regularly attend meetings, assemblies, and conventions. They encourage, educate, enlighten us, and deepen our understanding as we attend. But to be an acceptable citizen and show we cherish our place in the kingdom arrangement, we must prove to be as it is written by Jesus' fleshly brother James at James 1.22. He says, however, become doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves with false reasoning. We must adhere to kingdom standards of righteousness by applying what we learn as Zephaniah 2.3 directs us. Seek Jehovah, all you meek ones of the earth, who observe his righteous decrees. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. Probably you will be concealed on the day of Jehovah's anger. Jehovah's people have been educated on what physical and moral cleanness is and what is acceptable in the eyes of Jehovah. We're not blinded by the world standards and practices that are in rapid moral decline. Those who seek to gain entrance into Jehovah's kingdom must do so with the complete heart by following the example of his only begotten son and our king, Christ Jesus. By doing so, we will ensure that we can enjoy a spiritual paradise even now in this world that is in a constant state of panic and confusion. But also, we can enjoy kingdom blessings that will last forever. Do you cherish the opportunity to live in that paradise that is just around the corner? If you do, then you surely want to be accounted among those described as generously and lovingly inviting people to come and let anyone hearing say come and let anyone thirsting come let anyone who wishes take life's water free just as millions of jehovah's namesake people worldwide are proclaiming the good news of the kingdom as matthew 24 14 states that this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. Friends, 
Soon everyone living on the earth will be united under kingdom rule. Divine education is already uniting millions worldwide. Earthly subjects as Isaiah 2, 3, and 4 predicted would occur. And many peoples will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will instruct us about his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For law will go out of Zion and the word of Jehovah out of Jerusalem. He will render judgment among the nations and set matters straight respecting many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning shears. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, nor will they learn war anymore. Soon will resurrected ones have an opportunity to become subjects of the kingdom, as John 5, 28 and 29 explains. Do not be amazed at this, for the hour is coming in which all those in the memorial tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who did good things to a resurrection of life, those who practiced vile things to a resurrection of judgment. So take your stand now for God's kingdom and cherish your place in Jehovah's kingdom arrangement. If you're not already serving Jehovah with a view of living in the kingdom soon to come, we humbly, yet urgently, invite you to consider the prospect. At the beginning of our discussion, a question was posed, remember? If you were given the option of being rich in this broken system of things where pain and sorrow and death are impossible to escape, or you were poor in this system, but you would enjoy eternal life with no sickness, pain, or death forever. Which would you choose? No doubt, Jehovah's people wisely cherish their place in Jehovah's organization. Both now and very soon to come, the privilege of living forever in that paradise where sickness, pain, Sorrow and death are distant memories. That kingdom we so eagerly pray for and anticipate is a promise, an everlasting guarantee from Jehovah God Almighty, from the one and only true and living God, Jehovah, of whom it is impossible to lie. Do you cherish your place in the kingdom arrangement?